Sup everyone, this is Carrick with ACG, the bearded shaman of gaming, leading lost gamers to cool games at the speed of embargo. What do we have today? Well, today we have Technomancer, a cross between Total Recall, KOTOR, and a number of other games made by Spider, the developers of this one. Now, Technomancer tells the tale of, well, the Technomancers. Think spiritual Zen masters with the ability to duracell themselves to the point that friends and families just fruiticide under a Sith Emperor's amount of electrical energy whenever these guys decide to lose control. So really, who better to be a hero of a tale based on Mars in an action role-playing game, you ask? No one. So you play Zachariah, a technomancer who's just coming up the ranks, and quickly the story grows from this atypical do this, do that kind of RPG to a planet spanning adventure that will have you kicking one armed KOA campground campers out of their favorite spots, shooting harmless people in the face, and teaming up with a group so haphazard that honestly they make the Suicide Squad look a little bit like a band of camp counselors. Of course, Technomancer is out soon, 28th, for the PS4, Xbox One, and PC, which this review is based on. As always, if you like the video, eh maybe subscribe. So here's the review for Technomancer, a sequel for a game few people ever played, people so badass at stabbing them in the face with an electrified piece of rebar doesn't kill them, and an entire world that has the hospitality of the word nope. Graphics are up first. Junkyard chic. That's really Technomancer in a nutshell. From the wickedly high, very real physical barriers of social dynamics built into the main city, placed carefully to keep the barelys from the never-haves and never-gonnas, to the almost pickled confines of the seedy underbelly that exists in every city that you're going to visit, there's one thing that Technomancer does well, and that's atmosphere. There's a complex sense of verticality here as well. Really, this is one of the first games where I feel they might have just went a bit too far, though. Level design is really particularly labyrinthian in the choice of pathing with debris, blind corners, and sprawling, questionably built steps in the mysterious city of Noctic, replacing the military checkpoints constructed of concrete and ill wishes that the first city has. Let's be honest, here there are cities that possibly would have people starving to death in the streets because they thought they would go out and get a bottle of milk at the local Mars Foods and can't find their way home. However, that complexity also means that what's so great here is that most major locations look different with a few exceptions, but within them there are discrete layers of varying levels of filth and technology combined, giving everything a very lived-in feel, even if a number of problems crop up that I'm going to talk about a bit later. Really, level design has to be mobile, and this is, but it also has to be interesting, and this is, from the deep down underground with the wildlands and dangerous beasts that seem to be in this constantly tit-for-tat with the city's inhabitants, to the stretching and bull-like Noctis, a mix of Middle Eastern sensibilities in a city that sort of looks like someone built it inside of a collapsed football stadium that a pissed-off god threw down a mountainside. However, Damn, people on Mars are ugly. I bet Mars Tinder probably is just a bunch of profile pics of the weapons that they'll bring to the date. While characters are suitably defined, they all suffer from a serious case of someone ironing out most of the body's skin details, resulting in many of them look like they were painted just prior to whatever cutscene they're in. It looks very last generation at point. Now, their faces are noticeably better off for the most part, and the lead character who apparently wakes up every morning doshing his face with large amounts of lie, looks the part with scars and burns having a more ingrained look on his face rather than appearing like a decal, which we do see in other titles. NPCs look okay, with the major players having a great deal more detail than the occasional generate an NPC look of the others. Monster designs run from okay to, oh my god, what made it with what over there? And I felt that their otherworldliness really helped. Now, announcing Stevie Wonder on the keyboard. Yeah, the NPC's animations, especially for the store owners, is a thing of just pure nasty. I'm not sure what they were doing, but when I get three all pretending that they're hammering away at invisible grand pianos, you know that someone dropped the ball somewhere. While the game ran very well on the GTX 980 and on the GTX 1080, I think you would assume that, if you use their higher anti-aliasing routines, you can start to see some pretty severe fluctuations from moment to moment. And that's of course because the game world is made up of alternating level design, and it's bound to hit the card harder when you're coming around a corner from a normal boring drab cave and you see a sprawling metropolis in front of you. As a package, I would say it's a fully realized world that's really interesting and it's inhabited by okay looking people in some pretty damn good looking places. I only wish that the outdoor areas looked cooler, but if you've ever seen a picture of Mars landscape, it's pretty much just rocks anyway. Sound, music, Reason. and voice. We're all scared of what we don't understand. It's why so many fear us both. Not that I'm sure any of the masters even asked them to take me back. It was more important to them that I disappear for good to hide what happened, keep the illusion of their infallibility intact. Mr. Manser, the sight of your face has started to give me agita. To what do I owe the displeasure this time? I'm looking for a prostitute named Sarah.
And of course, sound is always up first in this trilogy of Audio Awesome. Whether you're ripping, grabbing, slashing, slamming, stabbing, shooting, kicking, flipping, or even electrifying enemies, I have to say, I was actually really pleasantly surprised. In many titles with smaller budgets, we see effects like reverb, echo, room spacing, and full sampling getting cut first. Not here. And the fact that a full throttle battle to the death inside a room with 11 people all playing wall ball with your skull has the proper effects and sounds noticeably closer and more personal versus, say, when you're taking out a group of marauders in the Mars Wastes is a testament to most people paying attention to location and layering than, say, many other devices. Developers. Now, sadly, while the up-close weapons sound great, I couldn't find a single gun in Technomancer that apparently didn't use firecrackers for propulsion. Nicely enough, guns aren't that abundant anyway, and when you're in battle and you don't know you've been shot, and then you take around to your head, you know something is probably a little off with the sound. And while ambient sounds play out regardless if you're inside the seedy dive bar or walk in the scum-filled burps, it's never felt varied enough and thorough enough. I wasn't able to easily pick up a sound loop. It just didn't seem as it was full-throttled enough for me, and especially compared to the other effects. As a package, though, it's honestly surprisingly good. I would have loved to have had more varied outside environments, and certainly I wish someone could find the low-end knob of the guns, because currently it has all the impact of being shot with a scowl in bullet form. And that, of course, brings me to music. Man, this is hit and miss, and probably more miss than hit, which doesn't bode well because I have the soundtrack in the damn Steam purchase. Not sure what I'm going to do with one half of the soundtrack that I don't really like. You see, while some locations have this excellent transition and connection to their location, with one absolutely awesome track that's a series of low chords all echoing like they're in a cavern, then you suddenly hear what sounds like that time your three-year-old cousin found your grandma's old Casio keyboard and just started beating the shit out of the keys. I would say half the soundtracks are really good, resonate with the locations like they should, and have instrumental chord progression or theme that sort of connects them. The other half do absolutely nothing for me. Even worse is sometimes the mixing is off, and at times where the music should almost seamlessly sit with the graphics on screen or what's going on, it doesn't. It bounces off and never feels at home, and in fact, oddly, getting in the way of actual voice. And that, of course, brings us to voice. You know, sometimes voice is based on the emotional resonance the voice actors deliver, but also the sheer amount which is delivered. And Technomancer is absolutely deep in content, but not so much in presentation. The main character has moments of brilliance, and whomever wrote the cadence of delivery understands little things like mid-pause, the rethinks of sentences, and even stuff like redirects. But sadly, only about 50% of the main character's speech hits anywhere near the mark, with some of it coming across like someone randomly found the script on the road and is just reading it while walking to get a bagel. Now, that doesn't actually mean that the entire game is like that. The game's absolutely deep with vocals, which is amazing. I love that because the prior title had a lot of lore to sift through, and here even, it sort of seems like sometimes the presentation isn't the best, but still, they wanted it voiced, which is great. But then, of course, enter stage right, bad guy McDoucheberg. You know his kind, the man with the voice and mannerism, so second nature to being a bastard, you could tell he's untrustworthy if you saw a damn picture of him from orbit. His delivery is that scary hush and tone that I love in bad guys. Yes, it's cliched, but it's completely enjoyable. The moment he shows up, and anybody trusts him, you're like, what are you doing? Anyway, as a total, I'd say good voice work for the most part, but luckily the main character is usually asking a question rather than answering one. Gameplay. So as Zachary Mancer, you've just passed the rights to the coveted group known as the Technomancers, when all hell sort of breaks loose while the story takes place in protected cities that men and women of Mars have built after contact with the Earth was lost long ago. It also stretches its legs out to various locations that you travel to using a quick travel rover, so no Mako moments here. You're never really in control of that. As a Technomancer, you explore, gather a series of players to join your group, and proceed to milkman your way through a number of side quests as you also try to figure out a way to unlock the main story narrative. Now, while there's very little surprising in the overall presentation here, and it cribs heavily from Bioware's grouping style narrative placement, and even the original KOTOR starting area, and themes, Technomancer's deep fiction runs throughout the entire world, and in many ways is a strong argument for continued exploration in the world, both in this title and possibly sequels. Sadly, Many strengths here are also combined with weaknesses. Take, for instance, the combat system. Using a combination of stances, staff, sword and gun, and blunt item and shield, each with its own moniker like warrior, rogue, and guardian that interact with their own skill trees. And this is a skill tree system that I like to easily call, yo dog, I heard you like skills, so we've got skills for your skills so you can get your kills while you level up your skills. When upgrading them, not only do you pick the passives and actives and new attacks, but those attacks and passives and actives also have their own sub-skills sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. What that means is I'll 
upon first glance, it looks like a robust system, but it's actually much deeper than first glance. It's stupendously stretchy, really, in its use. And not only could two players play specialist rogues much differently than one another, like any good RPG system, I think. But the split here is that some skills having seconds means that one might be a disabling bastard, dropping enemies left and right, even with the slightest of attacks, while another can disrupt characters guarding, power up a force field that also pushes enemies around, and just basically laugh maniacally as they pinball enemies around a level. It's not like something like this hasn't been done before, but the depth and the single lines of customization mixed with that depth adds a flexibility and sort of allows you to feel like there's really no limits to what skills you want to put where. Really, really enjoyed it. Of course, you also have talents, which are passive upgrades, like the ability to sneak better, or talk your way out of scraps. And then you have uh, attributes. Now, attributes are pretty much what you'd expect, like strength and agility, but they also interact with the weapon system and what you can carry around, and what you can even use. Now, the weakness, as I said, there always is one. It's because it all sounds excellent and shit. Most of the time it is, but the sad thing is in combat, it's always oddly stunted. Even at the higher levels, there's this odd cadence to combat. And while some battles have an almost chaotic awesomeness to them with a giant number of enemies fighting and can be breathtaking to engage in, that doesn't mean that the next battle you won't meet two enemies who are sitting and rubbing up against one another like you intruded on their imminent plans to breed a mutant. Additionally, you're apparently held to the physical properties of solid matter, but characters aren't. While you may have problems leaping, diving, or somersaulting out of the world's scariest menage a trois, they can still hit you, even if there are like nine enemies on the screen all between you. The game has a habit of holding inputs in, which also means sometimes a fight's done and Zachary's too busy telling everybody, hey, watch me, as I do eight cartwheels before he puts away his weapon. This also happens in battle sometimes, leaving you at the whim of a Scarface cartwheeling electrician who is attacking an enemy who is not there. Of course, while not telling people you want them to do what you want them to do by beating them to death, you're running around the world and doing various things, using skills and talents to interact with characters, influence them, get into places you shouldn't, and uncover the larger growing story. While not interacting with other characters, you interact with the game world via the skills. Of course, what would a game like this be without purporting that the poor people steal better than the rich, resulting in a sad choice that if you want to have a good lockpick skill, you basically have to wear someone's six-day sleepover blanket over your shoulders, effectively titled beggar's clothing. Now, luckily, some items lay to raise that stat, but just bear with me. Still, switching shirts while standing in front of the 800th IKEA space cabinet because the game arbitrarily tells you your lockpick skill's too low gets annoying fast. Luckily, it's pretty much the only skill that is so basic in its application. Sadly, it is also the skill that is the most financially rewarding. Now, lastly, you have a somewhat detailed crafting system in place where designs are found and purchased around the world, and you can build new items, upgrade those that you have, and switch them out with the characters that you use them with. It's not amazing, but its inclusion allowed for even more flexibility. Just one more thing, what would a game like this be without interpersonal politics? The story themselves, about the characters themselves, did I like the characters? I thought they were really enjoyable. I thought each one brought something unique to the table, and the tangible way ways in which you can affect the party as you move forward and some of those choices, bravo, very, very well done. When you really sit back and think about it, a game like this needs to make sure that the choices you make in character progression impact the worldview and are noticed by the player in tangible ways while giving the feeling of exploration, story building, and tension. Technomancer does that despite a series of missteps. Fun factor. <laughs> Technomancer does not impress at first, guys. And at times, it wears its budget rating on its shoulder a bit too proudly even for me. Like the first location, which is boring, and it left me with a sour taste in my mouth. Then the game began to open up. Now, whether it was the absolutely long-lasting character choices you make in your group, as I spoke about before, with probably the best repercussions in an RPG I can remember in a long time, or exploring the cities of Mars, there's actually a lot to like here. Also, the fact that the form meets function in Technomancer is instantly noticeable, whether it's the weapons or the architecture. These aren't reflective of the many millennia after mankind turned Mars into Plymouth Rock and they still have all this cool stuff. Instead, it looks like everyone during a fight said, whoa, 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 hold on. I got to get to Lowe's and I got to pick up some pipes and some O-rings so I can make a mace to beat you to death with. Everything has a used, reused again methodology to it, which is not only excellent from a graphical standpoint, but really fits within the game world's fiction and mirrors the way the people experience it as they live next to one another. Of course, amid all this dirt and rust and nastiness, there's going to be a world infested with bugs and creatures and unfortunately, that also goes to the actual title itself. For example, the game just promptly forgot I killed someone, and I didn't just beat their head in, I actually beat them up, then sucked out their blood and used it for cash, because apparently everyone on Mars is half vampire and blood is money. I'm running around and everyone kept saying, hey, go talk to this guy, hey, this guy probably knows stuff, hey, why don't you go kill this guy? What, kill him again? Is Mars so damn dangerous that you need to wipe some fucker off the face of the planet twice, just to make sure? Again, puff. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for a sale, rent, or if it's a PC title, deep, deep sale, and of course, never touch a rating scale. 
This is actually a buy at $40, but let me explain something. This is rough as F sometimes. It is also a game that is absolutely enjoyable to explore if you are like me and like deep world views. If you do not, then this is going to be a wait for a sale. So this, in a way, I'm saying it's a buy because it's a game I like, but you need to understand what you are getting into. This is a game that is deep. It reminds me a little bit of a much, much improved Mars Logs. It has an incredible number of cribbed moments from Coke tour and it's really got some excellent parts that they've sort of stolen from Bioware whether it be like I said before the characters and the way they interact with one another just the way the narrative works and the worldview but it is not perfect by any means shapes or forms so do not think that when you buy this game everything is going to be perfect not even close so anyway that's it for me I hope you guys liked the video if you did thumbs up maybe check out our patron it really really helps check out Facebook Twitter what have you make sure to tell people about the channel if you dislike the video give it a thumbs down and as always peace out